Okay, welcome everyone to another edition of Life with Ghosts. Let's chat. And we have a special guest tonight. Cheryl Page is with us. It should be a fascinating interview. Please stay muted during the interview so we don't hear background noise on the recording as we are recording this. And it will be available later on YouTube. So without further ado, over to you, Stephen. It was 2017 and Cheryl Page was working as an oncology researcher. And the love of her life was crossing the street and was hit by a car and killed. The police called a friend apparently of Cheryl's and then that friend called Cheryl and broke that news to you. I know your life pretty much did a 180 since then. You were a, a left brain, very science, a, a fairly normal scientist. And you were not interested in anything ghost or paranormal related at all. And suddenly this happens. But before we go into like the trajectory that you were sent on, could you tell me a little bit about the love of your life? His name is Scott. Could you tell me about who you and Scott were in life, in this life? That's a really, it's a really great question. And I'll be completely honest, you know, Scott was the love of my life. And, but the truth is, even though we were a couple, our love affair, or really the profound part of our love affair started July 7th, 2017. And it is so much more large and so much more robust so I could tell you about our life and the things that we did and who we were, but it was so not as interesting as it has been. You want to just skip forward to after the car accident? Is that what you want? I to think do? it makes the most sense because it's the place <laughs> where it got way more interesting. I think Scott was way is a way more interesting person than me anyway, okay. but it got way more. Okay, let interesting. me rewind. Let me rewind and try that again. It was 2017. <laughs> it was the summer, July 7, 2017 when the love affair between Cheryl Page and the love of her life, Scott, that's when it started, really. <laughs> is, that, yeah. is that better? That's better. That's It's okay. more the truth, yes. Okay. So tell me, well, now we don't have the contrast, though. We don't know what you guys were like before. How do I know it's better? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. <laughs> tell me how it's better. How it's better is that there is no way to the person that i was on july 6 2017 is not the person that i am today he died that day on the 7th of july and i the part of me perhaps that needed to die died on that day as well and the shocking thing was he ended up being my midwife birthing me into this new paradigm and so, you know, we went to concerts and we played pool and we did sort of life things beforehand, but it wasn't. And he was a traveler and he was a really interesting guy. But sorry, Scott, I can't make it about you. It's really about me and what happened as a result of his his graduation. He graduated to the next octave on July 7, 2017. And on that day, another journey that I could never have anticipated began. And that's, I'm in awe of what's possible. And I think that what I want to say is death and distance are the lies. He didn't die and he didn't go off above a cloud somewhere. He's in the next room. That next octave isn't very far away. It's flat foot to tippy toe. And so it wasn't that instantaneously I had this epiphany and all of a sudden I have wings and infinite understanding. It was certainly, you know, I was ripped from the moorings of my life when at 8.37 a.m. on July 17th, 7th, I got that phone call. Well, well take, take me through it. Take me through at least the bullet points. Take me through what happened and how that happening changed you. Yep. So it was a normal work day. 
I had actually gone to work and I came home to bring, bring my kids some breakfast when this call came through at 837. And the reason I got the call was because nobody knew how to get a hold of Scott's family except me. So I was called so that we could call so his family could be notified. And it's not news that you're ever prepared to receive. This wasn't a slow, agonizing death with cancer. It was he was here and then he was gone. And it was as though the, all of the oxygen was just sucked out of my life. And so you have to go through the, the motions, right? You have to talk to the coroner. And it's an unattended death for all intents and purposes because he was hit by this truck. And so then there has to be an autopsy and I have to choose his clothes and I have to talk to the funeral home and, you know, all of the logistics that are involved means that on some level you stay afloat, you want to die, but you have to stay afloat to manage all of the minutia of managing someone's passing and so I was dealing with the police and his 92 year old dad wasn't able to handle those logistics. So I was tasked with all of those logistics and he didn't want to see Scott in the funeral home, but I needed to see Scott in the funeral home. So I chose his clothes and I delivered them. He died on a Friday. I delivered the clothes on Monday and Monday afternoon, I got to go and sit in this chapel and hold his hand. And wow, <laughs> nothing prepares you for what that is. Yeah. And I'll tell you, <laughs> I have really close friends on the line today that don't even know this story, but. I was sitting there in this chapel. It was just him on a gurney <coughs> with his clothes and his sunglasses on his head and his flip-flops on his feet. And, and I thought about Jackie Kennedy. And I remember reading a story about how when she was in the hospital after Jack Kennedy died, she kissed him from the top of his head to the tips of his toes. And I thought, you know what, if it's good enough for Jackie and <laughs> Jack, then it's good enough for me. And so I kissed him from the top of his head to the tips of his toes. And, and I didn't know the amazing journey that was still ahead. I was still in that tailspin of grief. And I'm so grateful to be on the other side of that kind of agonizing pain. So what what happened to to start your journey to where you are now? What was the first thing that happened? <laughs> well, the funny thing is, I you know, I was completely a neophyte at all I knew is that Scott was this whirling dervish energizer bunny kind of a human. And I knew that he couldn't be extinguished. <clears throat> and so I began to ask the question. But I didn't even have the language of, is continuity of consciousness real? Is it possible that he survived, that his consciousness still existed? And so I suppose I did what, <laughs> what all of us do when we have that kind of a loss. You start reading books and you start talking to people. And I didn't know anybody who knew anybody who knew anybody who knew a medium. It was the farthest from my reality. And yet... I know Scott and Scott was always the guy who would say to somebody, I know somebody who can hook you up. And he was always the guy putting people together. And I now in hindsight, know he was behind the scenes, making sure to push people into my path so that I would find my way. And I just started the simple way that I started was just saying, Scott, you need to let me know that you're here. Give me a sign. Give me a sign. Give me a sign. And, but you know what guys, we have to learn how to recognize, like we're making the ask, but if you don't even know what you're watching for, 
then I think that they're trying so hard and it's just poo poo. It's just flying over our heads. So how did you know what to watch for? Well, you know, I think in hindsight, it's 2020, but magical, amazing things started to happen. But again, I was suffocating on my grief. And I think that that's where you hear mediums say, you know, you don't want to do a reading too soon because grief is such a heavy emotion. That's true. It's not just about not having a reading. It's you're encased in that grief so that the obvious perhaps is is passing by you but i i did start to receive signs and yet it's that same thing did i just make that up did that really just happen you know all of the ways that we doubt when we don't know what we're looking for but signs started to happen and more and more amazing more and more quickly so it was, I guess it was Scott then who was basically ushering you into, you called it a rebirth, right? This was, yes. he was ushering, he was the midwife. Is that how you put it? He yeah. was the midwife who ushered you into this new space. Yes. But what you, you were, you were a scientist. You were still are a scientist. That's not the way you think. You don't think in terms of, oh, we go on. So yeah. what, how did you bridge that gap between what was happening and how you were, how you were thinking? It's a great question, and it's and I had to find a strategy. But I want to just add in a disclaimer, Stephen, because I think it's a, such a slippery slope. I just want to my disclaimer is that I'm not claiming that I have all the answers or that mine is the absolute truth. This is my present understanding from my present level of ignorance. So uh, take it for what it's worth. But these are all true to life, end of one experiences that I had and i had to find a way to balance the science and now all of a sudden there's this spirituality thing and the way that i found as a coping mechanism if you will was just a simple phrase what if what if it's scott what if it's not what if that just happened what if it didn't what if his consciousness survived what if it didn't but if i could say what if it left me in a place of possibility rather than my, sad to say, historical stance, which was, that's not true. That's not possible. As opposed to, what if? That was what saved me. So I guess you asked, what if? What's the, what's the rest of that sentence? What if what? Well, it was th amazing things kept happening. I was, I mean, so it's like, is that real? Is this happening? And so one day, it was about six weeks after he passed, and Scott was one of those people. His nickname was Froggy. Every, I mean, they literally, no, I see you smiling, Joan. Everybody knew him as Froggy, so much so that when they said Scott Whitlock died in the newspaper, people didn't know who that was until it said Froggy. So I was driving across to another valley and there was a hitchhiker. I never pick up hitchhikers. Single woman, you know, your mother tells you never pick up hitchhikers. And yet I'm driving and in my mind, it's not like I know yet that Scott's talking to me, but I hear Scott say, he's not a murderer. It's 8,000 degrees outside. It's August, pick the guy up. So I pull over, I pick the guy up, he gets in. He's clearly a homeless guy, but he's not a, he's a clean homeless guy. So anyway, he has a little sign. He's driving to this hot springs and I'm driving right by. So we're chatting and I'm talking. He said he just came back to the valley and we we're talking about how things change. And I said, oh, my boyfriend just got hit by a car and passed away last, last month. And he says, Froggy? I wow. said, yes. He goes, everybody loved Froggy. He was amazing. And so now all of a sudden there's this bond with me and this homeless guy. And so we're talking and he's telling me about his life and all this. And so finally I realized, I realized I'm being rude. And I said, what's your name? Scott. <laughs> so great. So we get to the hot springs. Scott loved hot tubs, hot springs. I asked this gentleman if he would put some of Scott's ashes into the hot springs for me. 
And he was so grateful. And he said, I would be honored to put Froggy's ashes in the hot springs. And that was August of 2017. And fast forward to June of 2018. It's 1130 at night, sitting at home. I hear some sirens. And 11 months later, Scott Adams was hit by a car on the same highway. Oh, my goodness. A, just a few miles from where Scott passed. I got one Scott. I got another Scott. And it's like, to me, that it sounds tragic, but it's actually magical that Scott Adams showed up to give me a gift. And I wonder sometimes as we get closer to the veil, something like that might become possible. So it sounds like after this, Basically, we don't, we're not going to call it a coincidence, or we'll call it a um, synchronicity, or how, what would you call it exactly? I changed the use of the word coincidence to coincidence, because it's where we coincide with spirit. Okay. So there was this co... <laughs> Give me the word again? <laughs> coincidence. Coincidence. We have this coincidence. It still feels like a Herculean leap to make from where you were to where you are now. Yeah, so I need. I think I need you to fill in the color a little bit more for yeah. me in terms of. Okay, so I have are, some. Just, just so people know who you are. Yeah. Right now, you are you practice mediumship. Yes, and, and so I'm sorry. Before I you was go on before you go on. I'm, I'm giving you a testimonial right now. I just <laughs> I just had one conversation with you. Your ability to connect seems profound. You're not. You don't seem like a novice to me. You don't. You seem like somebody who's been doing this all her life. So. Now, I, you please continue. So I missed, Suzanne Giesman had come to Carbondale to do a talk, but I missed it. I wasn't aware that she was there. And some friends had gone and said, oh my God, she's amazing. And so I watched the videos, I read the books and I thought, okay, her waiting list is two years long. Doesn't matter. She's left brained enough for me. I'll still be interested in two years. So I signed up for her waiting list. Two weeks later, she called me on the phone and she said, this is Suzanne Giesman. I've had a cancellation and you're supposed to have a reading. And I made sure that she didn't, you know, what do I know? She didn't Google me. I made sure I changed my email address. I did all these backflips to make sure she didn't figure out who I was. But she came up with where he died and how he died and that he used to live in France and he used to play base, you know, professional baseball and all these things and his name. And so I asked her at the end of the reading, I said, it's clear to me that you've connected with him. How do I do that? Because I don't want to spend the rest of my life going to mediums. And she said the one word I hoped she wouldn't say. Meditation. I, you know what? I was going to guess that word. <laughs> <laughs> I've said that a number of times in a kind <gasps> of way. So she says meditation. I said something a little more profound than shoot. And she said, no, think about it this way. Prayer is asking and thanking. Meditation is listening. And it took all the pressure off of me because I didn't have to sit in a lotus position and have prayer flags and drive a Prius. I could just sit and listen for him. And so my meditation became listening practice. And... In my humble opinion at this point, there is no way around it. If you're going to get there, some form of listening practice is required. And if you call it listening practice, it's not as intimidating as meditation. So I began listening for Scott. And with her guidance, you know, I had hemi-sync on in the, my earphones and she said, just listen for him. Ask him to come, listen for him, and over time, spirit has the ability to push a thought into your conscious awareness. So listen, and over time, you'll be able to tell the difference between him giving you a thought and a thought that's yours. And so what I can tell you is, it seemed like he showed up right away, but what do I know? And I hoped it was him, and so I basically had to just keep going back to, what if it's him? What if it's him? Hold the space of what if it's him. And, but if you open the door, I mean, my declaration is 
I serve the light. Anyone who serves the light is welcome here. Scott shows up. My friend John shows up. I got other people showing up, but I don't know if it's real or if I'm making it up in my head. But over time, it begins to be clear through evident, very not I was standing in a meadow and a butterfly landed on my arm, but really clearly evidential things started to happen to let me know that something was unfolding. Very cool. I want to let the audience know that I'm going to be talking to Cheryl most of the time tonight because I, I was looking forward to this for a really long time, but there will be a Q&A afterwards. Cheryl has agreed to stay a little bit late. So, you know, we, we will we will let you guys ask questions at some point, but not yet. I'm not really quite done yet. <laughs> so, first of all, that's fantastic. Now, let me ask you this question. I am not a good meditator, I don't think. I've tried. I feel like I fail. Um, it was advised that I don't try so hard because I was just getting down on myself that I try just other things. And you you corroborated this is probably okay for me to either look at a picture of a meadow or um, would, would walking, would, would, could I walk to a walking meditation, you think, Cheryl, and also get and also listen to for my beloved? Let me give you my mathematical equation because I can't help myself. So for me, meditation is A plus B equals C. A is the activity, that's the non-variable meditation. B, what is your intention? Is it mindfulness? Is it you want to sit beside bliss and higher consciousness? Is it you just want to lower your stress? For me, my intent was I wanted to connect with Scott. So my intention, my B, drove C, the outcome. So whatever your intention is, if you just want to lower stress, that's different than if you want to connect with spirit. So A plus B equals C, pay attention to what your B is because that's going to drive the outcome. I was only meditating to listen. I wasn't trying to be at peace I wasn't trying to lower stress. I just wanted to connect with Scott. And so I think that the thing that I wasn't ever taught, I did transcendental meditation when I was 12 and I was given a mantra. What the heck's a mantra? Nobody told the 12-year-old me what a mantra was for. And now I understand. But here's the thing I want to say that's more important than like, you know, Suzanne's guidance to me was always meditate with a notepad in your lap. Close your eyes. You have the hemi-sync, which I do believe is the secret sauce. And you have a thought. You open your eyes. You write it down. You close your eyes. But more importantly is to understand what's happening. So there's the do this. But then physiologically, there is data, scientific data, to document both the neuroplasticity changes in your brain and the upregulation of your central nervous system through a meditative practice. And the reason that's important if we stick with the intent of listening to spirit, people say chakras, some people say energy centers, but if you're upregulating your central nervous system, what are you doing? You're making yourself a bigger radio antenna. And the radio antenna receives the information and transduces it into useful information. And here's the other thing, Stephen, that's really important people understand is the biggest question I think we ask early on is, well, what if I made that up in my head? What if that's just my imagination? Exactly, yes. How do I respond to that? Here's the thing to understand. Think about your imagination like a blender. If you have a blender in your kitchen, you can make a smoothie with your blender. If I come to your house, I can make a smoothie with your blender. So spirit can come and use the tool of my imagination. We make this mistake of thinking imagination always means fantasy or imaginary. This incredible author wrote a piece in like 1964, 1969 called Henry Corbin. It's called Mundus Imaginalis. And he talks about the imaginary versus the imaginal. But 
my friend Joe Taylor, who's on the screen, shared with me a thought. This is not my wisdom. This is somebody else way smarter than me. Is imagination is to intuition as talking is to singing. So you couldn't intuit if you couldn't use your imagination, just like you couldn't sing if you couldn't talk. So don't confuse the tool of your imagination. Make no mistake, spirit can push a thought into your conscious awareness and give you visual images, smells, sights, sounds, using the tool, the blender of your imagination. I got to tell you, I love the way you just framed that because that makes sense to me. Because I am, I guess, a logical person too. And that I really love the way you put that. But you did something with me when we met where you told me, you showed me what the difference is, how it feels. You know what I'm talking about? Putting an item in my hand, changing oh, colors. Uh -huh. Could yeah. you do that for the audience right now? Because I got a lot out of that. Okay. Do, do, and, do it with me and everybody, everybody should do it with me. Okay, so that'd be great. And actually maybe we could do it with Gary because you already know what to expect. Oh, that's true. Is that okay? Gary. Make yourself so, see Gary. <laughs> are you good, Gary? I okay. am. All right. So I'm going to give you an exercise where you are going to experience the tool called your imagination. Okay. So just close your eyes. Okay. And just make something up and put it in your hand. And it doesn't matter what it is. And I don't need to know what it is, but just make something up and tell me when you have something in your hand. Okay. You got it? Yes. Okay. Now look at that thing and tell me what color it is. Um, silver and clear. Okay. So if you look at that silver and clear item, and I want you to just, and keep your eyes closed. And so you're looking at it in your mind's eye Bang. and you see the silver and clear thing. I'm going to ask you to change it to some different colors. And I just want you to say, okay, every time it changes to a different color. All right. Okay. So you see the silver and clear thing. Yes. Yes. I want you to change it to yellow. Okay. Change it to purple. Okay. Change it to green. Got it. Change it to blue. Got it. Change it to white. Yes. Change it to orange. Okay. Change it to black. Okay. And change it back to silver and clear. Got it. Okay, so you can open your eyes. So that is the fluidity of you using the tool of your imagination. That's mm -hmm. you running the blender, okay? So now what I would like for you to do is I'd like you to pick someone in spirit that you love that can help with the next part of the activity. I don't need to know who it is, but tell me when you have someone in mind. Okay, I do. Okay. So now what I want you to do, I and mean, here's the part that's really important. There is no right answer. I need you to be a scientist and just report what happens. It's tempting to think, oh, there's a right answer and I'm gonna give the right answer. There's no right answer. This is just crime scene investigator. Just report what you see. Mm -hmm. All right, so you've got your loved one in your heart, right? Correct. And I want you to close your eyes and I want you to imagine you hear a knock at the door and you walk to the door and you open the door and there's your loved one and they stay surprised. And in that moment, it's more than love, it's joy. Yes. And so you invite them into the house after you give them this bear hug and you go and you find a place where you can sit on the couch thigh to thigh. So you energetically, you're touching each other, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, what I want you to do this time is keep your eyes closed. I want you to hold out your hand. And this time I want you to ask your loved one to place something in your hand. The very first thing you think of is the thing. So don't second guess, doesn't matter. Got you it. got the thing? Yes. And what color is it? White. Okay. So feel the love of your loved one. Look at the white thing in your mind's eye. Yeah. And I want you, this is the part I need you to just tell me what happens. I want you to look at that white thing and I want you to try to change it to any other color and tell me what happens. Hmm. Interesting. Tell you what happens? 
Yes. It was a cassette tape that had a very pertinent song on it uh, related to this person. And when I changed it, all the music on the cassette tape changed. <laughs> and so, okay, you can open your eyes. Okay. And so invariably, well, sometimes it's that it won't change and that you can feel the resistance. I imagine somebody, some felt the resistance of it not changing. I felt the resistance, Cheryl. Yeah. And when I first did it, I forced it to change and then it changed back. And I've had people say exactly what Gary shared, which is I tried to change it and it changed into something else. It was like the resistance is in the form of, okay, I gave you this and you're trying to change it. So I'm going to mess with it. Right. It morphed into something else. Yeah. Another item. Exactly. That happened to me also. Yes. But was still relevant to the person, I will say. <laughs> Good. That was a fantastic demonstration. Um, you know, for me, when I first, when you first did that with me and just now, it definitely gave me an idea of what that difference is between imaginal and imaginary. Now you said it was that book, but what, I thought it was Fred McMyer, Fred, Frederick Myers in the 1800s who came up with imaginal. It might be, but there's the article, if someone was going to Google it, it's Mundus Imaginalis by Henry Corbin, 1960s. I think it's 1964. All right. Very good. Well, thank you. You're welcome. It was great. I am now going to um, remove Gary's pin. <laughs> no offense, Gary. <laughs> so what, tell me what you're doing now. Tell me what you're doing now that's like, wow, I can't believe I'm here. This is what's happening in my life now. This is what I'm doing. Tell me about that. So I think that it's important to underscore the first time where I really understood that there was a capacity. And so I'm going to protect the names to protect, you know, change the name to protect the innocent. But six weeks into my listening practice, I was meditating one night. And granted, I'm a researcher. I know how to take doc documentation. And I felt like I was just, sometimes it was just a shopping list of things that I was hearing. And that night I heard Christopher Tassel, 1954 airplane. Don't know what that is. In real time, I'm trying not to break my state and think about what that is. I just write it down. I get done with the meditation and I'm looking at the piece of paper and I'm thinking, I don't know what who Christopher Tassel is, but I go to Google because I'm a researcher. If you don't know what it is, you look it up. So I go to Google and I type in Christopher Tassel, 1954 airplane, and up pops this obituary I was in Colorado at the time. It was some family on the East Coast. Christopher Tassel died in 1950. No, in 2014, he was born in 1954. And, but what am I supposed to do with that? And now I feel Scott's here. They're not really in my ceiling, but I was sort of looking at them like they were in my ceiling. So I got Scott in my ceiling. I got my friend John in my ceiling. And now all of a sudden, this guy, Christopher Tassel, is in my ceiling. And... I'm thinking, what about the airplane? So I go back and I find the next row down. There's a guy, same name, jet airline pilot. And I realize it's the son of the guy in my ceiling. Wow. So I still don't know what to do with it. And what I hear Christopher Tassel say to me is, it's Christmas. You got to call my family. You got to tell them, no, I'm still right here and I love them. And I'm in my room by myself. But I said, you are totally on crack. I am not doing that. I don't know these people. They're going to think I want something. No, I'm not doing it. So I'm going to bed. You guys figure it out. If you're going to talk me into this, you're going to have to get creative. So I go to bed. I get up. I meditate. And there they are, Larry, Curly, and Moe in my ceiling. And the the feeling is, you got to call my family. you got to call my family. you got to call my family. And so I pick up this book. Suzanne Giesman had a new book out called Still Right Here. Just came in the mail. I hadn't read it. Picked up the book. I said, okay, here's the deal. And again, if there was anybody, there was like a hidden camera, I would look like a crazy person. But I'm just having this conversation with these three guys in my ceiling. And so I said, okay. The backstory is when I closed my eyes and Scott was there, I saw blue, sparklers of blue. 
And Christopher Tassel Jr. was a jet airline pilot. So that's important backstory. So I pick up the book. I said, okay, here's the deal. I'm going to open this book to a random page. And whatever my eyes land on has to be a sign. Or I'm not, I'm not doing it. No searching the page for meaning. So, okay, deal. Close my eyes. Fill my heart up with joy. <sighs> open the page. And my eyes land on the phrase, jet, blue, airlines wow okay so i say to the ceiling i guess i'm calling your family and the only way i have to call his family is through the jet airline company so i'm thinking okay i can call i can send an email but on the on the website his personal email address isn't there so fine i'll call dial the number i get a automated voice thank you for calling jet charters for sales, press one. For repairs, press two. And for Christopher Tassel, press three. I'm thinking, cool. Get to leave a voicemail. So I push three, and he answers the phone. And now I'm in deep water, like, holy crow. So I point at the ceiling, like, you got me into this. You better help me out. So I put on my least crazy oncologist researcher voice. And I say, hello, my name is Cheryl. I'm calling from a cancer center in Colorado because I knew his dad died from, from cancer. Said, I was wanting to send you a personal email, but uh, your personal email address isn't on your website. I'm hoping you would give it to me and I promise I'm not a crazy person. So he laughs and sure, and he gives me the email address and I'm just about to hang up. I said, thank you. And I'm about to hang up. And he says, do you mind if I ask what it's in regards to? Oh no. Okay. Jig is so, up. <laughs> so I, I white lied a little bit just to sort of keep it on an even keel. And I said, well, it's regard in regards to your father. And I think we might have a friend in common. Who knew? Maybe he knew Scott, John. I don't know. So I said, but I'd feel better if I could just send you an email. You don't have to reach out to me. You don't have to call me back. I just am compelled to share the information. And you know how guys are. A woman wouldn't have let me off the phone, but a guy's like, oh, okay. <laughs> right, you know. Very good. Yes. So we hang up and I type this email and Scott and mediums and listening and Christopher Tassel, 1954 airplane. And I include a picture of me and Scott to add some validity to it. And I send the email. And I point to the ceiling. I said, fine, I did it. I'm out of here. I got to go to work. So I go to work. Two hours later, the phone rings. It's the sister of the guy I talked to, the daughter of the man in my ceiling, and she's crying. And she says, oh, Cheryl, my whole family has been in tears since we got your email. Because every Christmas since my father died, he finds a way to let us know that he's still right here. And this year, you're the messenger. Fantastic. I love that story. And I knew in that moment, God bless those people for being kind and for being receptive. And I knew in that moment that something bigger was possible that I had not imagined. And that, I think, really was the the, the shifting point for me of, okay, what else is possible here? And so fast forward through practicing with friends and joining a mediumship practice group and uh, asking friends, just, can I just practice and see what happens? I don't know what I'm doing, but one thing led to another. And so we can fast forward to 2023 20, and it's not a ton, but I've done over a thousand readings in the last six years. And that is the, it is mind boggling to me that that is possible and that to me, people say, well, you know, you have to be a born medium. That's crap. I don't agree. I don't agree. We're either all born mediums or none of us are. But I believe it's hardwired. If we're cells in the body of God, the universe, then we all have this capacity. And my mission at this point is to simplify as much as possible so that everyone who knows that kind of staggering pain can understand that this is a learnable skill. I am living proof that anybody can learn how to do this. And so, so people can come to you for mediumship. They, you also teach mediumship. I, 
yes and no. I mean, I have a mediumship group that I lead, but I'm beginning to explore how do I disseminate this information in a way that uh, being one of me and having a day job, how do I realistically uh, disseminate that information? I'm working on a book to try to put some information into that space, but still trying to work that out. So, okay, so now I'm going to impose upon you and ask you what I... I project everyone in the audience is thinking that I want a step-by-step -step map, <laughs> okay? I want to know how to make contact. I yep. want to know step-by-step -step what to do. The first step, I believe, was inviting them, get into mm -hmm. a joyful state. You call it dog joy. Get into an, a, a joyful state, like your dog gets happy when they see you come home from work. And then you invite your loved one you make up an appointment at a certain time or just when, whenever they come by? When should they come by, Cheryl? Well, I would say if I could give everyone just one word, if you said I could only give one word and it being, in my opinion, you know, what if is our sort of foundation, but the one word that's the most important and is constantly in my assessment overlooked, ask. You have to ask. It's not enough to set your intention. And if you're asking, but you still don't know what you're looking for, don't blame it on them. So if you ask for signs and then you're not getting signs, here's what you don't do is go, he doesn't send me any signs. That's not fair. What you say is, okay, dad, I know you're here. I know you love me. I know you're trying and I'm not recognizing any of the signs you're sending. Help me to learn to recognize the signs you're sending. And when we met, just to let the audience in on something, because I met you, was it weeks ago, months ago, and I can't remember, but I was that person. I was saying, I try to connect to Jeffrey, my best friend who I lost 10 years ago. I try to connect to him. I don't get any signs. I was complaining to you. I, could, I think I could feel him around me sometimes, but I don't know. I don't have any evidence. And I was kind of begrudging him to some degree. And you said, it's not Jeffrey's fault. He's with us right now. And he's saying, it's not my fault. <laughs> Maybe you're not as a quick study as you think you are, Steve. <laughs> was basically what I got from you, from him, really. Yes. And I think you were 100% right. I, I, wasn't op I wasn't really asking him to come into my world. I was just expecting. And I was angry at him for not making a big splash. Yeah. So thank you for that. I am now much more open. I invited him here tonight as you instructed and um, I feel him with me. Yeah. So thank you. And it's all, this is not a spectator sport. Whether it's you're asking your loved one for signs or whether you go to a medium, we have to break this habit of thinking that this is a spectator sport. Like I'm just gonna sit here and okay, mom, Prove to me that you're here. That's Don't do that. That's the wrong frequency. And the reason why I say joy, it's like if you think about the energy that moves through your body when you're in a place of joy, love can be complicated. Like, you know, you might love your dad, but it was a complicated relationship. So I've stopped saying love as much as joy because joy doesn't have any question in it. Love doesn't have any cloud. I mean, joy doesn't have any cloudiness in it. But if we ask, so if step by step, what if means you stay open? What if that was a sign from him? And then ask and then pay attention. And I'm going to give you just a, like the best example of, and I've told this story before, so some will know this story, but it's the best possible story of, how it can be in layers, like a Russian nesting doll. It's never just, okay, he sent the butterfly. Then go and look up the spiritual meaning of the butterfly. Like how dynamic can you make it? So Scott lived in Aspen, Colorado. And when we would go see his dad, we would take road trips in my old blue Toyota. So then we he passed and I'm learning to listen. And it's Thanksgiving morning, the year after he passed. And I'm driving through this canyon and I can't really get a radio signal. So I turn off the radio. I'm driving along and all of a sudden I know that he's in the seat beside me. I know it. It's not even a maybe. 
it's he's there. So I put my hand into the passenger seat and I just start talking to him and thanking him for not abandoning me and for helping me figure this out. And as I'm talking, the palm of my hand starts to get hotter and hotter and hotter, like someone's turning up a stove flame in the middle of my hand, almost to ouch. And I say, oh my God, you're totally here and you're totally holding my hand. This is so freaking amazing. And because I'm a good listener at this point, I hear, turn on the radio. So I take that hand. I'm driving 70 miles an hour, trying not to crash the car. I poke the radio, put my hand back. And some random country song, the lyrics coming out of the radio at that exact instant were, if heaven is anywhere, it's right here, always having your hand to hold. Oh, my goodness. That's like and, right on the nose. And then I'm laughing and crying <laughs> and really trying not to crash the car, but I don't know the song. And so here's the teachable moment is don't stop there at, st at that he held my hand. Then I get the song. I've got the pad of paper. I'm writing down enough lyrics so I can find it later. The song ends. Another song starts. It's a song about holding the hand of someone you love. And so I get to his dad's. I come back and there's the notepad in my passenger seat. It's like, oh, yeah, I want to look that up. So I go into the house. And I look up the song, I find the song, I read the lyrics, I can't believe my eyes. So I watch the video, and I'm looking at the lyrics, and I realize this isn't just a song about holding the hand of someone you love. This is a song about holding the hand of someone you love while you're on a road trip in an old blue Toyota. <laughs> that's, that's so fantastic. Wonderful. Love it. Thank you. So don't ever assume that one thing is the whole thing. It's always more. They always layer the gifts. And we may, I, I, my assertion is even in a reading, you get the stuff that you know, yes, your grandma had an, an a apron with unicorns on it. She made apple pie every Sunday. Those are yeses, but what's packed in the yeses? What's packed in the nose? They do the best they can through the filter of the medium cut them a break and look a little, do a little bit of the heavy lifting. Don't just have them serve it to you. You know, pardon me. Do you have any great Poupon? I'm serving, serving it to you on a silver platter. But you're, you're saying it's okay to ask for evidence, right? Absolutely, Even though I've, yes. I've been told by some mediums that that, that, that emits a negative charge and you don't want to be dubious when no. you're dealing with spirit. But you're Are you asking okay with joy? To... I don't, I, I don't know. And my, my, my memory is not that good, but let me ask you this. <laughs> Um, you can ask for something specific or you kind of leave it up to spirit to show, to show you their own sign. Well, I think it's really an, a learning process, right? Because if, if it's you and me as a, fr as a friendship, you and I find our rhythm, you know, in this physical life, but it's also the same, like Scott and I had to find our rhythm within it with him in the next octave. So I think it's different. I think we can absolutely ask for specific things. Why not? The answer is no, if you don't ask. So experiment, but also don't be myopic in that I only ask this way. You know, I open random books. I, you know, I, I am as creative as possible. One day I'm passing the bookshelf. I see his picture <clears throat> on the bookshelf and I say, Scott, do you have a message for me today? I pick a book, close my eyes, fill my heart up with joy open the page, look down, my eyes land on the phrase, yes, I do. Hmm. Hmm. Very good. So how creative are you getting so that they have the capacity? Don't be boring. So you're really throwing them the gauntlet, I feel. I think you're saying, Steve and audience, be creative and do some of the heavy lifting. Don't leave it up to them and and work with them. You called it, you used a term, I think it was vibrationship. Am I saying that yep. right? Yep. You and Scott have a vibrationship. That's what, that was yes. Scott's word, right? Not yours. That's Scott's word. I asked him one day, I said, okay, when you were here, we had a relationship. Now you're here. What is this? What do we have? And he says, word I'd never heard before. We have a vibrationship. And because I need the definition then it's like, okay, what does that mean? And he says, meaningful connectivity 
between two people on different vibrational octaves. And so what if, this is something else I want to propose, Stephen, is any, I'm saying this a little bit tongue in cheek, but <clears throat> any reasonable person would say that July 7th, 2017 is the last day that Cheryl could make a new memory with Scott. Mm -hmm. But every single time I get a sign, that's a new memory and we need to hold it. It's not, they're still dead and gone and I got a sign. It's we have a vibration ship and they gave me a sign and I keep the journal of all of the signs because those are my new memories with him. Okay, you didn't answer this question before, but now you can answer it. How would you characterize your relationship with Scott now? Total badassery. I know if I'm allowed <laughs> to say that, but it's totally badassery. It's so dynamic and fun and interesting and joyful. And and he sets the bar high. It's not just, okay, Cheryl, here, let me peel you another grape. He ex He holds the bar high and expects me to meet him you know it, it's a partnership but it's a partnership that's equal it's just one on one side of the fence and one on the other side of the fence so it's very dynamic and he continues to be my greatest teacher you know it's funny i just had a mental image of the two of you and tell me if this is my psychic ability being accurate i feel like you're playing with him it's a it's, it's a game like you're creating with each yes. other yeah and you're developing your skills and you're both just having fun, it sounds like. Yes. And joy is a very high frequency. So every day I wake up, I kiss his picture, and I say, let's rock the day. And here's, you might want to write this down. This is a great phrase. Show me your presence in wondrous ways. If you think about words casting a spell... If I say to you, Stephen, you are the most amazing, creative, interesting person that I've ever met, that's a good spell. That makes you feel good. So if I say to Scott, show me your presence in wondrous ways, I don't say, show me your presence by sending me a football by noon. I could do that, but it's way more interesting. And again, as a neophyte, it may be you have to sort of get your sea legs under you. But as you start to build this vibration ship, then so the, the title of the book that I'm writing is Vibration Ship, Conversational Fluency in the Language of the Un, the Language of the Non-Local Realms. And so that's the thing I'd like to give you guys as an awareness. If you want to go to Mexico and you don't speak Spanish, you don't need to learn to read it and write it and have a, you know, Give your dissertation in it. Dos cervezas, por favor. Donde es el baño? You know, you know, you don't need very much in order to be able to function in a different language. So we do have to learn to function in this different language that they now speak. But if you could, if you don't think you have to learn to read and write it and, you know, write your dissertation in it, then it sort of takes, it lightens the burden. It's just a little bit. Flat foot to tippy toe. You don't have to travel very far and they'll help. Fantastic. Now I realize I've been speaking to you for about an hour. I do need to hand the reins over to Gary in just a moment and, and let the audience ask questions. But first I want to say two things. First of all, you are the most wondrous, special person I've ever known. <laughs> just, And I'd like you to tell me like, if you are offering medi mediumship readings, how do people arrange for that? Okay. Um, my website is quantumalchemy.world. So you can reach out to me through quantumalchemy.world. And um, I have a day job. I work 40 hours a week. So I pretty much do readings on weekends. So if I say I'm booking into December, it's not because I'm so fantastical. It's that I have a day job and I can only do readings on the weekends. But I will certainly be happy to correspond and communicate with people and try to get things set up if that's what people want. And what I love that even though we didn't, you and I did not have an official reading, you just, you volunteered some things to me and what I will share back to you and what made it so special for me was that I feel like, an, and you corroborated this too, 
that you have an expansive vocabulary and you are very well read. So when spirit wants to give you an analogy, let's say, you got it, you get it quickly. And I feel like just your library, as you put it, your library of words, your argo, your parlance, you're able to do more with that than I've, I've experienced with others. So that was wonderful for me. Um, Gary, it's time yes. for you to take over and let the audience ask questions. Please, I'm going to remind everybody, you're going to remind them too, Gary, because Cheryl has a limited amount of time, even though she's willing to stay late, she's not going to stay all night with us. Please frame your questions. So in the first sentence that you, <laughs> you say, the very first <laughs> sentence, your whole question is in that sentence. And then, and then listen for the answer. Okay. Um, Gary, it's, it's your turn. 